tarda i moltes gràcies per ser aquí en aquesta darrera sessió del seminari sobre la crisi i l'emergència de la crisi als països petits. Té molt mèrit encara aquestes hores del divendres a la tarda, per tant, estem extraordinàriament agraïts als que heu tingut l'amabilitat de venir-nos a escoltar i esperem, tenim dos conferenciants de màxim luxe i per tant estic segura que no us defraudaran i que el vostre temps serà ben retribuït. A més a més del públic vull agrair a la UOC i a la Fundació Capdem l'oportunitat i l'honor d'haver-me fet contribuir, d'haver-me fet participar en aquesta organització d'aquest seminari i bueno haig de agrair alguna altra cosa que ara mateix em costa de llegir i si se m'acut us la diria d'aquí una mica en tot cas passem tant de pressa com puguem a les intervencions dels nostres convidats. Ahir un dels conferenciants que va intervenir va fer broma i va dir que pel que fa a l'anàlisi de la crisi els macroeconomistes a Rost in Translation. Bé, jo crec que avui els hem de donar una oportunitat de defensar-se i de reivindicar-se. Ens acompanyen dos macroeconomistes eminents i tinc la convicció que tant l'un com l'altre donaran proves més que suficients que Lost in Translation potser ho estem tots, però coses a dir en tenim també des de molts punts de vista i un de molt important és el dels macroeconomistes. Jo no soc macroeconomista, però estic convençuda que tenen l'aproximació macro de no fixar-se gaire en els arbres i de mirar-se al bosc també ens pot ajudar a entendre el que ha passat, el que està passant i el que hem d'esperar de cara al futur. Bé, no us vull ocupar ni un minut més del vostre temps amb les meves paraules, que només us donen reiteracions i llocs comuns, i passo a presentar-vos i donar la paraula als nostres distingits conferenciants. La meva ponència serà en anglès. Si em permeteu, canvio l'anglès. Thank you very much for the invitation. I was asked by the organizers to address the following uh, sentence, the following uh, title, which is, what is the crisis from a macro macroeconomic perspective? I add to that a medium-term perspective um, as to take into account not only the current situation, but also the origins of the crisis and also where we're going, what is the, the future as, as I see it. Um, I understand in the last days you have been discussing a broader set of issues relating to uh, the position of small nations, how strategically address the challenges from the crisis, how to exit from it. I will not be able to address many of these questions myself. I'll have this macro broader perspective, but I hope I can touch a little bit on those and some of those issues also. Uh, allow me just a little bit of a protocol for a central banker speaking in, in a public event. I have to uh, make the following disclaimer. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the European Central Bank. The views that I express are my own views and should not be casted as views of the European Central Bank, and, and please take that into account, especially if there is any journalist in the, in the, in the room. Uh, another caveat I mentioned already is that I will tend to focus on this broader topic of the macro uh, crisis, not so much on the detailed uh, aspects of, the, of this seminar. So, with the housekeeping remarks being made, uh, give me, let me give you the the root plan of my, of my talk today. So I have these, these items. Uh, I'd like to do is basically to start distinguishing the, from the word crisis in the title of the presentation. We need to distinguish at least two set of episodes, the 2008 Lehman Brothers and the May 2010, let's call it Greek crisis. I will go into the details of that. Then I will make a detour and give you some stylized facts of how this situation came about. So which factors generated even the role especially of the financial sector, which grew very strongly over the previous years. Uh, number three, I'll come back to the current situation, the conjunctural situation today. How do, we, how do I see uh, the macro perspectives in the euro area and also the financial perspectives with a euro area focus? And then I'll 
perhaps take a broader institutional perspective and say, well, for the exit from this macro perspective, what is necessary? What are the steps to be taken, both for the economies, the governments, and also for European level institutions? And there I will be somehow taking the usual line for uh, someone coming from a big institution in Europe. Okay, so let me start with my first item, which is the review of the recent crisis. And I, I chose this chart to try to make the point that I, I'll try to explain now. Did we have a pointer that I could use? Uh, no. Okay, never mind. So what, you, what we have here is corporate default swaps, CDS, uh, CDS premium. CDS premium are financial instruments which are used to hedge against certain risk, in particular default risk, the possibility that certain institutions, be it governments or private institutions, in this case it refers to banks, fail, become, uh, get under default. You can see the evolution of these corporate default swaps here for the US, also for Europe, the UK. Uh, the red line is the US, the blue line is the euro area as a whole. If you look at the beginning of the, of the chart, uh, January 2007, that was before the crisis. Well, there was a lot of benign view in, in Europe, in the world, that somehow the crisis, I mean, there was not even a notion of a crisis. Uh, around August 2007, there's an ignition, and it started to creeping. You, you look basically at the beginning of, uh, of the increase of these of this, uh, lines here. That keeps going up, creeping, until you reach the sort of uh, turnaround, the big uh, catastrophic, let's call it, uh, situation that generated, was generated or unfolded around um, the Lehman Brothers default, September 2008. But you see the red line is the US is somehow leading this push for this CDS swap. So the probability, the notion, the perception by markets that something was going wrong, that many banks could default, was not only increasing, but also somehow being pushed by the US development. Uh, in Europe, things were more benign, it was affected, there was an echoing, uh, uh, an impact from the US, but somehow later and, and, and much more subdued. So this is the episode you're seeing, this big you know, skyline at the beginning. Then things in 2009 start to calm down, and you have later on in 2010 a very different development, which is now led by the blue line, which is the European situation, and with the US also being affected, but not very much and decreasingly so, to come to a situation now which is quite stable in the US compared to the Euro area. But there's a second phenomenon that I'd like you to point from this chart, which is that while in the Lehman period, the first skyline that you see here, the blue line does not split into two lines. Europe is basically a single entity, so the different banks are moving very closely, starting in even before May 2010, but around late 2009, beginning of 2010, you start seeing a departure, a discrepancy between two lines here, which is the green line and the blue line. And the green line reflects this CDS, this uh, default measures, but for those countries which are non-stressed, which are not suffering these peripheral debt, uh, sovereign debt problems. So basically the green line is the CDS for banks in Germany, France, Luxembourg, Holland, Austria, etc. The banks that are not suffering now the stress situation. And there's the decoupling between the euro area as a whole and those countries which are more or less proceeding relatively safely. So the second phenomenon or, or feature of this, of this May 2010, of the second crisis, is that it's a regional crisis that is affecting some regions much more than others. It's not a pan-European region. It's, it's really a, a diversity uh, issue within the euro area with very different profiles country to country. And I'll elaborate a little bit on that, but this distinction is very important when speaking, when using the word crisis. We have to distinguish between these two. Um, okay, so let me maybe say something still about the um, the generation, the main factors behind these two crises. I'll try to, be, to keep it very brief. Um, starting with the Lehman, the, the global financial crisis, the Lehman crisis in 2008. I think there's, a, there's an interesting puzzle to reflect on, and there's some, it's useful to give you some figures, uh, which is the estimate of the total losses that were generated by the subprime sector, so this giant mortgages that were being produced in the US. Uh, if you remember in real time, those who follow these, the estimates were very difficult. People, initially, people were talking of a few billions. I'm talking about the Anglo-Saxon billions, so thousands of millions. Um, but now we talk about one trillion, perhaps as an upper bound for these, for these losses. If you compare that with 
the measure of household wealth before the crisis, so the total wealth of the US household sector, as of 2006, you would be talking about at least 75 trillion US dollar. So if you compare the losses that were generated in the subprime, one trillion, with 75 trillion as total wealth, we're talking about 1.3, as a one-off, 1.3 percent, this vanishing uh, of, the, of the wealth of the households. So it's not a big amount. It's 1.3 percent. So how is possible that a shock that was a one-off 1.3 percent had such a big impact and had such a turnaround over the whole global economy? Um, so this is a long story. I'll try to make it short. But there are some key aspects that need to be pointed out. Excessive leverage that was somehow building up previous to the crisis with inadequate provisioning by banks, so regulatory failures in the US, but not only in the US. Uh, behind that, uh, a key phenomenon was regulatory arbitrage. Uh, when banks give mortgages, they have to keep capital uh, linked, uh, reserve capital associated to the, uh, to the mortgage. But there are certain weights uh, Basel, in the case of the U.S., uh, Basel II weights, um, linked to whether you securitize or you do, not, you do not securitize the mortgage. If you securitize the mortgage, the, there's a smaller way that you have to apply, and therefore you have a lower cost in terms of capital that you have to put aside. Therefore, there was an arbitrage opportunity. It was more interesting for the banks, instead of just creating mortgages and keeping capital requirements to securitize uh, those, um, those mortgages. And that had strong implications on the incentive to control this so-called generate and distribute model. Mortgage were being created, then quickly securitize, cutting tranches in very obscure products, and then you get this lack of control of the quality of the mortgage that were being produced. So these factors are key in the generation of the crisis. They were going on for a number of years before 2007. There's a third phenomenon, which is the concentration of risk. So the risk that those people holding securities associated to mortgages, which included tranches associated to subprime, were also buying insurance. And that, the insurance companies were very concentrated and were keeping concentration of the risk, in particular uh, AIG um, in that respect. So that concentration of risk was another factor that somehow created this time bomb that exploded in September 2008. So what we saw there was a global systemic failure, sort of a banking crisis, which was not operating as in the 30s uh, on, on deposit runs, but was working on runs on off-balance sheet elements. So people were suddenly not wanted to, to hold these assets, these securities, and would rather sell them uh, at, fire, at fire sales uh, rather than keeping them. And that generated a whole, a whole wave of uh, lack of trust in the, in, the financial, in the global financial markets with impact on the real economy. Now, the European crisis that I'm saying is quite different. Of course, there are some elements which are very similar. There is a bubble behind. There is a, an element of growth which is demand-driven, but sometimes without sufficiently strong supply-side fundamentals. Um, there's a widespread, not only in the US, but also in many, in many European countries, that house prices could not decline. And that was a false, with hindsight, we know that is a false uh, belief, was a false belief. Uh, excessive spending, excessive debt accumulation and also misperceptions of risk and underpricing of risk uh, by financial intermediators, in particular by banks. And that was exacerbated also by low policy rates on both sides of the Atlantic and, and also very big, strong fiscal stimulus, again, both uh, both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but there's two elements which are specific of the, of the European crisis, which I would say are not present in the previous case, which is one is the fact that nominal um, competitiveness was being lost very quickly in some countries of the of the euro area and that's the same that now are facing facing difficulties they were members of a monetary union they had relinquished their exchange rate flexibility they had not the opportunity as in previous before uh, the euro area was created to use the exchange rate depreciation to get out of the crisis to gain quickly competitiveness and that's a very important specific phenomenon I'll refer to later and there, another one is the risk to solvency, so the, the, the accumulation of debt and the sus lack of sustainability, the insustainability of that debt is much more acute in the case of those European countries compared to the US. Um, so the result of those two crises compounded, and here you can see a little bit how it unfolded and the, 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 the uh, quite dramatic impact. So let me maybe just to, for the benefit of time, focus on the right-hand side panel of this chart, which gives you 
what happened to industrial production in level. So let's take the pre-crisis period, January 2008, let's make that 100 for, all the for these countries that I have here, and let's look how industrial production evolved after that. So you see in the first part of the crisis, in the Lehman crisis, all countries fell down the cliff, but jointly. It was sort of a common global financial crisis. And the losses were really very impressive. So we're talking about more than 20% loss in industrial production, even in those countries which were, which were half then proved uh, later on very resilient. But then after that, since 2009, what you also find is a very uneven pattern in the recovery across this country. So you find some countries such as Germany, which have been improving quite steeply and are, are now close to that level that was 100, into, so the same level they had in 2008, to some extent also for France, and some other countries which are struggling quite, quite much more for, uh, for getting out, in particular Italy, but also Spain, which is the red line, where somehow progress is hardly visible at the level of industrial production, and you are still 80% at the level of before the crisis. So this is a major impact. My next question is, how could that happen? What were the factors behind? Um, I will give you some key stylized facts, key elements that I think are, uh, hope are useful to understand how things were cooked before, before this uh, unraveling of development. So coming to my second block, some uh, notions of uh, the growth of the financial sector, country by country, before the crisis, and how the countries went through, somehow the performance of the different countries through the crisis. I'll try to make three points in this part of the presentation. First, I'll argue that the financial sector growth uh, clearly outpaced, was faster, grew more quickly than the rest of the economy, and that is, that is uh, probably you, you knew that, but I'll try to give some details on that. There's also a clear uh, evidence that the, the rates of return in the financial sector were higher systematically in the rest of the economy, and that's probably hard to be seen again in the future, but it's, it's interesting to see how that evolved. And finally, I will look at the relationship between the size of the financial sector and the, um, the growth performance of uh, the country, and I will argue that there's not a clear-cut relationship, so I'll try to, to sell the idea that Certainly, excessive financial development was a very important part of the crisis, but we should not oversimplify and just systematically have the financial sector as a scapegoat. I think we have to, uh, to make some nuances and understand different cases, which indeed are very, are very different, uh, interesting to, to, to uh, separate, to, to sort out. So, first point, financial sector grew more quickly. Just to illustrate, we can look at that through the cow compensation per, empl per, per employee, so wages basically evolve. Uh, the blue lines reflect, so this is something that has a trend because it's nominal, it's affected by inflation. Uh, the blue line is for the economy as a whole, so wages, labor compensation um, for the economy as a whole in the euro area, the US and the UK. The red line gives you the same, but for, just for the financial sector, and you see that there is trend is growing more quickly. So you see there's a, a, different, a differential in the rate of growth between these two objects. and the, Red, the other line, the red line, is somehow tracing the difference between these two, uh, these two indicators of, of, of wage compensation. You see for the US case in the middle, it's quite, it's quite impressive. It's telling you that basically compensation, wages in the financial sector, after a period of, of, about, five, of about 15 years, was 40 percentage points higher in the financial sector than in the rest of the economy. So there's a differential that was accumulating and was not undo or, or uh, curtailed by market forces, where, of course, you would uh, assume that, that maybe uh, the labor movement would be able to compensate such trend, but it, not, it did not happen. It just continued like that until the crisis. To some extent, you see similar movements in the UK and the Euro area, but to a lower extent. So instead of 40 percentage points of accumulated differential, you see about 20 percent for, for the UK and for the US, uh, sorry, and for the Euro area in the left, just 10 percent. Uh, so a bit more, more moderate, but the same, the same tendency, the same pattern as uh, for the U.S. Um, another way to look at this excessive growth or, or uh, potentially unbalanced or unsustainable growth of the financial sector is by looking at the share of the financial sector in value added. And this is what is, these charts are giving you, but for three sets of countries. So in the first case, we have this very strong growth in, in, in some countries, in particular in the US, which is the red line, where a value added goes from 5% to about 8% of total value added. Also in Ireland, we see a very, very important, very uh, big increase. In Canada, 
I will refer later to that. Also in Canada, we see major increases in, Hol in, in, in the Holland. In the case of Europe, the, in the UK to some extent. Then we see in the, for continental Europe, more diverse patterns. Even if we are in a single monetary union, still you see differentiated patterns. And um, in some, maybe the more striking case is the case of Germany, which is the black line in, in, the, in the center panel, where this proportion of uh, the financial sector within value added has remained quite stable and at a relatively low level compared to, compared to other countries. So Germany is a country which has not witnessed or uh, been subject to this strong expansion of the financial sector in a sustained manner. You also have Spain in that case, which is the red line, which is at a higher level than, sorry, Spain is um, the blue line, so uh, not too far away from Germany. Um, now, in the case of the Scandinavian countries, you see the lowest case, as they had suffered financial crisis in the early 90s, so coming to relatively low levels. So the, different, the, the patterns within Europe are quite different in that respect. Just a final piece of evidence to show you this surge, this uh, sustained surge in the financial sector. And let me focus here on the, the, the left panel. The left panel is giving you the size of the financial sector with a different measure. So it's measured by the size of the capital market, uh, but also shares, so fixed income, and also loans uh, given by banks as a proportion of GDP. And this compare over different sub-periods, starting in the early 90s, so five-year periods, second half of the 90s, etc. So what you get from this, from this chart is that for all countries, you have seen quite a strong um, growth in the, in the size of the financial sector, which basically double as a, as a share, uh, in terms of the share of, of GDP, on average for most countries. But for some countries, you see much stronger developments. So in particular, for countries like Spain and Holland, you see a threefold increase. And in some extreme cases, you see uh, Ireland and Luxembourg, which saw five or even uh, six times uh, expansion of the financial sector as, as measured here. Now, this helps me already to make my point. L Luxembourg and, and, and Ireland are the highest points in this chart, and, and, and they really show extraordinary increases. Nonetheless, the development or the consequences of this build-up of the financial sector is extremely different. Luxembourg is a country which is now doing quite well, whereas Ireland is under a program with the, with the IMF. So I'll come later to this comparison in terms of performance. Uh, my remark on uh, returns, so on the right panel you have dividend yields, so the, the rough measure of returns from, uh, from capital in the financial sector and the non-financial sector, and you see per permanently over time the financial sector overperforms, and arbitrage forces are not being able to stop that, and that went on for a long period of time. Uh, my third point goes to these links between, so can we say something about the relationship between the size of the, of the financial sector as a proportion of, uh, of GDP and growth performance, so the ability of these economies to grow, and in particular also whether those countries which were building up large financial systems are those the ones that systematically fell more, uh, more abruptly, more severely during the crisis. And that's what the, right panel, let me focus on the right panel, is telling, is, is trying to, to get to. I point some countries, I focus here on the smaller countries as, as, as uh, perhaps there's uh, echo some of the, of the discussions you had before. And you find again here very different stories. So you have Ireland is perhaps the worst performer, is this point left alone in the right corner. It's a huge financial se sector, a huge decline of GDP over the crisis period, so basically over the period from 2007 to 2009. So there you would say, well, this country really suffered by its excess uh, developments, by the bubble that, that took place. But you see other countries that over that period, like Finland, for example, had not gone through such, such massive buildup uh, in the financial sector, but nonetheless have a similar performance for those two years. Of course, later on, the, the developments have been very different, and Finland is recovering quickly, whereas Ireland is staying in a difficult situation. But at this, over this period, you see that also countries which were, have been relatively um, prudent in the development of the financial sector suffer a lot, of course, for different reasons. Also the case of Switzerland. Switzerland would be a case of a country with a very large financial sector and has been relatively resilient during, during the crisis, of course, at a cost in terms of uh, bailing out certain banks. So my, the, the bottom line I want to, to, to draw is there's not a simple lesson, as sometimes we see in, in some in some media or in some fora about what is the role of the financial sector. The financial sector, if well managed, um, still has, has delivered a lot of uh, 
advantages to some countries, and, and the, the case of Canada has to be mentioned. So Canada is a country that, as, as I showed before, um, developed its financial sector quickly, more or less at a pace similar to the US, but under a very different regulation, a much more cautious regulation, much more prudent management of capital requirements, uh, of margins of banks, and this, the performance of Canada during the crisis has been probably the, one of the most brilliant. So, no single cut, uh, shortcut in terms of trying to get lessons and the link between the financial sector, its growth and development, and the economy as a whole. Let me then move to my third block, which, as I mentioned, relates to the current situation. Uh, this is probably a simpler part of my presentation, so I, I probably can keep it shorter. I would like to basically first convey the notion that, indeed, we are witnessing a recovery in the euro area. It started already in 2009. And Maybe the good, the good, the good news, the good side of it, it has gradually becoming more self-sustained. So, in gradually becoming a little bit less dependent on the rest of the economy growing. But this is still very much dependent on the rest of the, the rest of the world, the uh, export capacity of the euro area. And this is what this chart is telling us. If you see the green component is the contribution to GDP, to real GDP over recent quarters, starting in the second quarter of last year until the last quarter of last year. This green part is the contribution from net trade, so exports minus, 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 export, export minus imports, you see that is positive and growing, so it's, it's the basis of, of growth, certainly in countries like Germany that are somehow driving the recovery. Uh, you see also at the beginning of the crisis, inventories played a, an important role, and consumption, which is the green, the, the yellow, sorry, the yellow uh, part of the, of the chart, is gradually gaining some ground, but still uh, contributing relatively modestly. So we are moving towards a recovery which has more impetus on itself, but it's still largely depending on policy stimulus in the first place and also export and the rest of the, of the world economy growing strongly, in particular the emerging countries. However, when looking at, instead of looking at the euro area, when breaking that information country to country and looking at how the, the diversity is evolving, there you see not so good news. Uh, so the, these blue bars relate to the latest observation we have, which is the first quarter of, 2000, of this year, 2011. The darker part is the euro area. Still, growth was relatively buoyant um, in the first quarter of this year at uh, 0 0.8, around 0 0.8. But you see that these parities country to country are quite exceptional. If you go to this to a similar chart from the period before the crisis, you would see much less disparity. Of course, Estonia is a special case, the country which is catching up. But look at the case of Germany, which is growing very, very strongly, buoyed by or uh, pushed by exports, but increasingly also by domestic demand, growing at 1.5% at quarter on quarter in Q1. Other countries growing relatively strongly, including France, Austria. Then you see a set of countries growing below average, Finland, Spain, and Italy. And then finally, some countries even declining, contracting relatively sharply, Portugal in particular, which is now going through financial strains. So on the one hand, we have a recovery. The recovery seems relatively um, robust. At the same time, if you look region by region, you get lots of disparity, and that is even more clear in the second chart, which is giving you the same, the same notion that I showed before with industrial production levels, but in, now instead of industrial production is GDP, so output in the economy. There you see a similar story, but you also can see what's going on in some other countries which were not included before, like Ireland, which is this light blue line, which is, continues to go down and is now at the, uh, quite a low, big percentage below its, its level before the crisis. Also, Greece, of course, we know it's going through uh, important difficulties, whereas other countries have already recovered the level before the crisis, in particular Germany. Uh, okay, so these disparities are continuing. In the case of Spain, also, we get this sort of flat profile with very slow recovery, and I'll come also to this to that point. A couple of remarks on so this field of the current situation, I spoke about a bit more the macro, a couple of words on the financial situation. So the main issue in Europe, of course, now is the crisis that, uh, of confidence for some of the sovereign debt in, in some of the countries. And here you can see very vividly how that is proceeding. So this is it's very similar to the CDS I showed before. These are measures of, of tension. In fact, these are spreads of the, of the bonds of different countries compared to Germany, which is probably the lowest, the safest bone in, in, in Europe right now. And you distinguish three sets of countries, those that are really at the nucleus of the crisis, suffering the most, Greece, 
Ireland, Portugal, which are the three first lines, which have, in a way, not yet stabilized in their increase of the sovereign spread. Of course, behind that, there's very little trade, so it's not always measuring real financing cost of these governments, which are in a program, so they're benefiting from the financing cost offered by the IMF and the European Union program. Then you see countries like Spain and Italy, but also Belgium, which is in the other chart at a different scale. These are countries that are still coping well with the situation, though their, their sovereign spreads are increasing, creeping up, but still remaining relatively well contained. And then you have a number of countries which are basically not suffering any type of sovereign crisis. They are relatively, I mean, still above the German uh, bond yield, but, but not very far above and also not fluctuating, not, certainly not trending up compared to that. So this situation, the situation of difficulty, of disparity of regional crisis certainly remains. And that has implications for the rest of the economy. It's not the, the risk of the sovereign debt of the, um, of the government financing is not ring fence, it's not staying contained in that sector, it's having effects on the rest of the, of the economy through a number of channels, notably through the funding cost of banks themselves. So banks have this zip code problem. If their sovereign country has problems in financing, they inherit, they are affected. And what you have here is the CDS of the sovereign on the right, on the, on the, on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, and the CDS of the banks. So this tension of the, of the different you know, of the different type of, of securities, sovereign and, and banks. And, you, and the darker points are farther in the past, and the lighter points are recent in, the, in, in time. So you see, at the beginning, we were at the low levels for both, but then they have been sort of creeping up through the diagonal. That means that the increase we saw in the sovereign have been associated, I'm not saying it's a causality link, but have been associated to also increases in funding cost on CDS for, for private banks with impact, of course, for the economy as a whole in terms of uh, credit provision, in terms of um, um, dynamism of the economy. Now, luckily, we only not, we not only see a worsening of this indicator going somehow farther and farther away from the origin, we also see a little bit of retrenchment and return to the center. And that's what the last points, which belong to the second quarter, so the recent weeks, are these sort of beige or light brown points. And there is some improvement that has to be, that has to be also uh, mentioned. Just for completeness uh, information in the case of Spain, we also see this pattern of an implication for the, of the sovereign crisis for CDS for banks, but also some improvement in recent quarters, which, uh, which was very much needed as to avoid a, a precipitation. So let me not dwell on the, what I have here is basically the summary that the Governing Council makes of the current situation that you can, you can see in the summary of, of President Richet after the, the press. So I will not elaborate, basically conveys the idea that growth is there, um, that we have an, a recovery, which is mainly exports driven. But there's one remark at the end that I, I want to highlight because it links to things I said before, which, which is a sentence in the, in the statement by President Trichet saying, however, activity is expected to continue to be dampened, to be slowed down, somewhat by the process of balance sheet adjustment. And I think that, that remark is very pertinent for the countries that are facing the, the uh, sovereign strains, but also for a country like Spain. For those countries that accumulated a lot of debt before, uh, in the run-up to the crisis, now that that leverage that was accumulated is paying a toll in terms of making it difficult to get out of the crisis and grow again. Um, the Governing Council also mentions the risk to the outlook. Um, the risks are balanced. They're not only bad news or, or worrisome developments. There are also some positive risks, in particular relating to the global economy, which is doing relatively well. But there are also downside risks that maybe I, I mentioned in more detail. And they, of course, mention the sovereign crisis that, that still poses um, risk and potential difficulties for the economy, for the euro economy as a whole. Of course, the energy prices are at extremely high levels and um, are subject perhaps to further increases due to the situation in North, uh, North Africa and also the somehow lingering complication in Japan after the earthquake. So let me come to my last, to my last um, block of my presentation, which is what to do. Um, I will not have any news in that respect. I will rem remind you of what uh, policy institutions are saying. Um, so first, you remember this issue of lack of sustainability, the accumulation of uh, price increases that were somehow making some countries such as Greece, etc., lose competence, comp uh, com um, competitiveness relative to the rest of the euro area, but also relative to the rest of the world. Um, 
so basically they are flexibility, structural flexibility is needed. Let me give you a bit more data on that. So this is telling us the cumulative growth in the price levels over the period since the beginning of the euro in 1999 until last year. And you see, I mean, in a monetary union, you would expect the different regions, of course, they may have differences in their price development, but those differences should wash out over long periods of time. And we're not seeing that for the euro. We see very stable, very persistent ordering. It's always the same countries which have low inflation and always the same countries which have high inflation. And that, at the end, accumulates and results in very in, in, in relatively sizable differentials in, um, in, in accumulated price levels. So what we have here at the dark part is the euro area. It's close to 20% because it's an 11-year period, so it's basically 11 times 2. Uh, as 2% is the infl average inflation in the euro area. And then you see some countries have been systematically be below 20, uh, below that mark. So, for example, Germany is, is precisely at 20, so has be had inflation below 2% year by year. And you have other countries which are well above that, that mark. So, for example, the case of Greece, close to 40%, so prices have increased double as much. Part of that is natural. Part of that is, of course, catching up and, and income, re real income and income per um, personal income getting closer to those of the more developed countries. But part of that is also related to nominal rigidities, which are then difficult to undo on the, on the downside. And also Spain is in that, in that set of countries with 30%, um, so 10 percentage point more than, 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 for example, the euro area as a whole. The other element, of course, is policy, policy responses. And there, also, you know, you know, at the, in the short, medium term, we have a number of countries we have to fulfill. Uh, rescue programs, uh, Greece, Ireland, and Portugal now. Um, it's key that these programs are fulfilled, otherwise it will be very difficult to, to overcome the current situation. Uh, we have a new framework for macroeconomic surveillance. We have something called the European Systemic Risk Board, which is a, a new creation, is being developed. Um, basically, gathers central bankers with supervisors and also the European Commission to discuss no systemic risk and how to tackle them. It has not many instruments, but its recommendations are mandatory, are, are, have to be have to be taken. Therefore, has certain leverage over uh, supervisor authorities. We also have enhanced country surveillance by the IMF. So a number of things are going on to improve the situation. And of course, the critical issue in Europe is the reinforcement of fiscal rules. As you may know, the Stability and Growth Pact was largely dismantled around 2004, 2005. And now it's being revamped, it's being recreated. And, and that is, is, is a crucial issue. Um, if you, this is the fiscal performance for most Euro area countries over a long period of time since the beginning of the Euro. Remember, there was this notion, I mean, for good or bad, but there was this notion that 3% was the, the, the upper bound for government deficits. And that was typically, uh, for many countries, not the case systematically. So for countries like Greece, uh, Slovakia is a different case because um, as, a, as a new member state uh, has a different dynamics. But Portugal, France, all these countries had their fiscal deficit well above this sort of notion of mandatory level of below 3%. Of course, during the recent period, which is the green bars here, you see even much higher levels. And of course, that part of that was unavoidable. But now it's important that these countries bring back, come back to orderly developments in their fiscal situation. That's a major challenge if you look at the levels for deficits, for example, in countries like Ireland, uh, as they are now. Let me try to end up with a more positive note, which is monetary policy side the importance of anchoring inflation expectations and nominal developments. And I think that that's probably the number one achievement of, um, of the euro system in terms of really bringing inflation expectations very tight to their objective. And I think I can say safely that, that probably that's, that something has been achieved to a higher extent than in other economies, including the US and the UK. And in fact, now the US is adopting some of the institutional features as regards communication and, and, and inflation, inflation objective as, as the euro system has. Um, so, just concluding, I talk about two types of crises need to be distinguished. I mentioned how the financial system outpacing the rest of the economy was at the root of the problems. Um, I mentioned the rates of return of the financial system were systematically above, and that's something that should change, I expect will change in the new situation with more normal, more similar, perhaps, rates of return. Um, I talk about this complex relationship between the financial sector and the rest uh, and the economic performance, and I say, well, don't buy uh, simple recipes. 
on the macro situation, the positive news what we have a recovery, but that recovery is very uneven. And also in the countries where we don't see growth, this is very much related to the over burden of debt, the over leverage that the countries suffer in the run of the crisis. Uh, to get out of the cri to get, at, get us out of the crisis in a, in a lasting uh, solution, we need basically countries to address the sustainability problems, the competitiveness problems seriously. That means flexibility at the level of price setting and wage setting, but also productivity, so R&D and science and, and, and improving the capacity and, and the pro of the production. And of course, credibility, which is a word that I, I'm glad to hear a lot lately here in Catalonia.